Let's begin by discussing the role and function of network components. To begin, there are L2 and L3 switches and routers. According to the OSI model, L2 stands for layer 2 and L3 for layer 3. The L2 switches perform switching and consult the MAC addresses table to decide how to forward traffic. L3 switches perform switching in the same way as L2 switches and additionally have routing capabilities. The routing table is consulted when routing. Forwarding is hardware based in the L3 switch. Specialized ASICs or application specific integrated circuits decide on routing. As a result, switching is quick. It is only capable of routing in the Ethernet ports. Fast switching is not possible in routers because forwarding is software based. It is capable of routing in ports with multiple technologies. Then there are IPS and next generation firewalls. A firewall's role is to shield one area of the network or computer from an adjacent area. However, next generation firewalls and GFW are capable of much more than just looking at the resource destination IP addresses and ports that are used in packets. NGFW devices can conduct deep inspection for in-depth analysis of application layer data. NGFW is capable of carrying out intrusion prevention system tasks. Following that, we have access points. Users are connected to networks through access points as quickly, effectively and securely as possible. A WLAN is established by this device. It uses Ethernet to link up to a wired router, switch or hub. Then there are the controllers, WLC and the Cisco DNA Center. For practically everything in your network, Cisco provides a very well-liked controller. Cisco DNA Center, where DNA stands for Digital Network Architecture. The DNA Center's objectives are Make network management simpler. In minutes, deploy networks. Reduced costs. Embrace third-party integrations and cloud services. Many access points are required for large organizations. Many APs are controlled by a wireless LAN controller, WLC. This device frequently serves as the brain of the system, managing functions like frequency usage and security. Autonomous access points are APs that can perform magic without the need for WLC. They are referred to as lightweight access points if they need WLC to configure and manage them. Then there is an endpoint which is computing device that communicates with our network to assess resources like data storage or other endpoints. Desktop PCs, Macs, laptops, smartphones, tablets and workstations are a few examples of endpoints. Then there are servers. Although servers are technically also endpoints in the network, Cisco separates them into their category. This may be the case because servers are the ones distributing resources on the network, whereas endpoints use the network to assess resources. Websites, file and print resources, computing power of applications, security software and much more can all be found on servers. For a variety of uses, servers can run Windows, Unix, Linux and even Mac OS. We'll continue discussing network topology architecture characteristics in this session. We'll first keep going with two and three tire architectures. Cisco has recommended that we divide our networks into tires or layers that are simple to comprehend and manage. The layers that make up the traditional three layer model are Assess layer. Users and work groups can assess the network thanks to it. It's also known as a workstation layer. Among the crucial tasks performed by the assess layer are Layer 2 switching Spanning tree Power over Ethernet POE and Auxiliary VLANs for VOIP QoS classification and marking and trust boundaries Port security Address resolution protocol ARP inspection Virtual LAN assess control lists VACLs 
distribution layer. It manages the boundary between the assess and co layers and offers policy based connectivity. It also goes by the name aggregation layer. The distribution layer performs a number of crucial tasks, including aggregation of LAN or WAN links. Policy based security in the form of assess control lists, ACLs, and filtering. Routing services between LANs and VLANs and between routing domains. Redundancy and load balancing. A boundary for route aggregation and summarization configured on interfaces towards the core layer. Broadcast domain boundary. Core layer. It offers transport between distribution switches on the enterprise campus. It also goes by the name backbone layer. The core layer performs a number of crucial tasks, including rapid transportation, reliability and tolerance for faults. The distribution layer's functions are transferred or collapsed into the core layer in the collapsed core two-tier design. Therefore, using just a core layer and an assess layer can drastically simplify a network. It carries out all of the distribution layer's tasks while also delivering the required throughput. We have spine leaf after two and three tire architectures. A two layer network topology known as spine leaf consists of spine switches and leaf switches. In a leaf spine architecture, every leaf switch is connected to every other switch in the network fabric. It is mostly used in the data center and is rarely used in the real environment. There are several benefits of leaf spine architecture. A network design that satisfies business needs while being as straightforward as possible. Load balancing between corroded devices is now simpler and more deterministic. Low latency. Simple scalability is achieved by including spine devices. Support for overlay networks in order to add a virtualization layer S. Then there's WAN and SOHO. A wide area network, WAN is a private, geographically dispersed telecommunications network that connects various local area networks. When you need to assess resources on the internet or at a different office location that is not close by, a WAN offers connectivity outside of your local LAN. Numerous WAN topologies are possible. WAN topologies that are common include PTP. Two devices are connected by a single connection in this straightforward WAN topology. Hub and spoke. In this WAN topology, a central hub device establishes WAN connections to outlying branch offices, the spokes. Full mesh. In this topology, every device is connected to every other device. As a result, it is the priciest and most complicated WAN topology. It can be complicated and expensive, but it offers excellent WAN path redundancy throughout the network. Single homed and dual homed WAN topologies. A single homed WAN connects to a single ISP, whereas a multi homed WAN connects to multiple ISPs. If one ISP completely fails to be able to route traffic for the customer, a dual homed configuration is very powerful because the customer can dynamically fail over to the surviving ISP. Multi protocol label switching or MPLS. It is a data carrying method for high performance telecommunications networks that route data based on brief path levels rather than long network addresses from one network node to the next. Numerous benefits results from this. One of which is the removal of difficult routing table lookups. Instead of identifying endpoints, the label describes virtual links paths between distant nodes. Because it can encapsulate packets from different network protocols, MPLS is also known as multi protocol label switching. Ethernet T1 E1, ATM, and DSL are just a few of the assess technologies that are supported by MPLS. The majority of ISPs, if not all, run MPLS internally. Metro Ethernet An Ethernet based metropolitan area network, MAN, is known as a Metro Ethernet network. Subscribers are frequently connected to large service networks or the internet using such a network. 
Additionally, business can use Metro Ethernet to link up the offices within their own building. A synchronous digital hierarchy (SONET) slash SDH or plesiochronous digital hierarchy (PDH) interface with the same bandwidth is much more expensive than an Ethernet interface. Due to the widespread adoption of Ethernet in business and residential networks, an Ethernet-based access network has the additional distinct advantages of being simple to connect to the customer network. ISPs frequently use MPLS to implement Metro Ethernet services. Finally, there are on-premises and cloud. On-premises or on-prem resources refers to all your SOHO or enterprise networks, IT resources, computing, storage, and network. Numerous businesses are eager to benefit from cloud computing, so an increasing number of tools are being created to assist in the migration of and slash or synchronization of on-premises IT solutions with the cloud. Just two come to mind, the AWS Database Migration Service and Amazon Web Services AWS Data Sync. Today, cloud services are extremely popular. It seems that everyone wants to adopt some aspect of IT as a cloud service from businesses utilizing Dropbox business and Gmail to enterprises building their own cloud services. Some larger businesses create their own cloud services in data centers that they own and control privately. Such a setup is known as a private cloud. A public cloud service, on the other hand, is one that is offered outside of the company. Many private businesses and individuals can assess cloud services from public cloud providers like Google with Gmail. The virtual service model has developed thanks to cloud computing. Here are some crucial instances of cloud technology as a service term you should memorize. IaaS Infrastructure as a Service IaaS makes the hardware, software, servers, storage, and other infrastructure components available to the customer. IaaS providers can also host clients' applications and take care of tasks like system unkeep, backup, and resiliency planning. A pioneer is the IaaS cloud sector is Amazon Web Services (AWS). Software as a Service (SaaS). SaaS allows cloud service providers to make content software accessible to customers. Gmail is a prime example of SaaS because it allows Google to offer high-quality email services to users all over the world. Platform as a Service (PaaS) With PaaS, the cloud provider makes virtual machines (VMs) accessible to customers so they can test drive software applications in the testing environment. PaaS providers frequently include software development tools as a part of their platform. An AWS Drupal instance is an illustration of PaaS. XaaS X as a service Everything these days seems to be offered as a service and XAAS or EAAS is the term used to describe any aspect of IT that is provided using a cloud model. In order to make cloud-based data centers a reality, virtual network services are spreading more widely. Virtual networking has changed traditional networking in the same way that virtual machines (VMs) revolutionized the computer industry. More and more network functions are being virtualized including firewalls, routers, DNS services. A data center's flexibility and ability to scale more like a cloud are increased by the virtualization of network services. Of course, this results in increased programmability. Let's proceed to the next topic, physical interface and cabling types. So to start, we have single mode, multi-mode fiber and copper. Today, copper Ethernet resigns supreme even in terms of cabling. At its core, Ethernet no longer solely consists of copper. The standards also cover fiber options which allow blazing speeds over comparatively long distances. Ethernet is still developing and speeding up. 
as far as we know a straight through pin out was available to secure disparate devices together a router and a switch for example there was a crossover pin out for securing similar devices together a switch to a switch for example the fact that modern cisco switches support auto mdi hyphen x a technology that enables a switch to function properly with whatever cable is connected between the switch and any other device means that even though these pinouts still exist they are much less problematic automatic medium dependent interface crossover is also known as auto mdi hyphen x unshielded twisted pair is used in the most widely used versions of ethernet utp there are numerous utp categories which are abbreviated as follows categorized into cat1 cat2 cat3 cat4 cat5 cat5e cat6 cat6a and cat7 so what is the difference between multi mode and single mode fiber glass serves as the transmission medium for the singles as they travel through a fiber optic cable the zeros and ones that system used to communicate are transmitted by the signal which is light long cylinder and flexible glass is used in the cable score multi mode fiber and single mode fiber are two types of fiber optic media that are incredibly common the 9 micron core of the single mode fiber is small and only allows one path for light to travel along it multi light paths are made possible by the two large diameter core sizes of multi mode cables which are 50 and 62.5 microns respectively in contrast to multi mode cables single mode cables have theoretically limitless bandwidth multi mode cables are better suited for short distance applications while single mode cables are more appropriate for long distance ones both of them come in duplex and simplex configurations we then have connections ethernet shared media and point to point both wired and wireless media can be used to transfer data cables used in wired media include twisted pair fiber optic cable and coaxial cable the term radio frequency is used in wireless media computers are linked by communication channels each of which connects exactly to computers with full channel bandwidth flexibility in communication hardware packet formats etc is made possible due to the fact that the communication channel is not shared it offers security and privacy then there is power over ethernet poe network cables can now carry electrical power thanks to a technology called power over ethernet poe this enables devices like wireless access points and ip cameras to receive data connection and power from a single cable for instance when installing a digital security camera two connections must typically be made to be able to communicate with video recording and display equipment you need a network connection a power connection is required to provide the camera with the electrical power it requires to operate if the camera is poe capable however only a network connection is required because it will also get its power from this cable voip phones ip cameras wireless access points and other gadgets use poe benefits of utilizing poe include savings in time and money by lowering the time and cost associated with installing electrical power cabling flexibility devices like ip cameras and wireless access point can be placed whenever they are most needed and easily repositioned if necessary since they are not tied to an electrical outlet reliability unlike a network of dispersed wall adapters POE power comes from a single globally compatible source. It can be easily controlled to turn off or reset devices or it can be backed up by an uninterruptible power supply. Scalability. 
Having power on the network makes it easier and more efficient to install and distribute network connections. How to recognize interface and cable issues will be covered in this session. When working with a complicated technology like local area networking, a lot can go wrong and there are a lot of things you should be aware of. A switches show interface command lists a ton of potential errors and issues that can arise because of interface and cable problems. Example, on a Cisco switch, display the interface command output. A network that has been properly designed should not collide. On an Ethernet network where every host uses the same carrier medium, a collision is possible. We can now create full duplex networks with switches that intelligently queue frames to prevent simultaneous transmission. A PC connected to a switch port serves as an illustration. A distinct collision domain exists at each switch port. Network switches can be configured to operate in either duplex or simplex mode. A simplex device is unable to send and receive data simultaneously. These gadgets can transmit voice or listen to other channel users. Network devices can send and receive data simultaneously thanks to a duplex. A network may experience errors for several different reasons. A bad network interface card or electrical interface, for instance, could prevent things from being framed properly for the network. Keep in mind that the best way to find these mistakes is frequently by checking the frame check sequence. FCS. Data packets with additional bits and characters added for error detection and correction are referred to as having a frame check sequence FCS. Errors frequently happen because network communication uses a variety of data transmission media. A particular FCS is added to the frame's data bits before transmission of each frame of data. Before sending a frame, the resource determines this FCS which is checked and compared at the destination. A successful transmission is one where the FCS data agrees. If not, the data frame is mistakenly automatically discarded. One of the best error control methods is FCS technology, which is still widely used due to its ease of use. A duplex mismatch may occur if an older device has half duplex hard coding and new code LAN devices connected to full duplex. Because some packets typically pass through the connection without issue while others are dropped. Such errors can be challenging to track down. Devices can use half duplex networks by using carrier sense multiple assess with collision detection CSMA slash CD, which is used in half duplex networks. Another area that can lead to conflict is speed. When there is insufficient network buffering to handle and influx data and drop packets, a speed mismatch occurs. Sending from a fast host to a slow host may cause issues for some network paths, but the performance is unaffected when the slower host sends to the faster host. Examine the device for a duplex mismatch if counters in the output about FCS, CRC, alignment or runs are increasing. The term duplex mismatch refers to a situation in which the connected device is operating at half duplex while the switch is operating at full duplex. Extremely slow performance, erratic connectivity and connection loss are the effects of a duplex mismatch. We will compare TCP and UDP in this session, but first let's take a look at the main roles that each of the OSI models layers plays. Physical layer. It specifies the physical and electrical requirements. The actual physical connection between the devices is its responsibility. Information in the form of bits is present in the physical layer. Physical layer devices include cables, modems, hubs and repeaters. Data link layer. It is in charge of delivering the message from node to node. This layer's primary responsibility is to ensure error-free data transfer from one node to another over the physical layer. It is the responsibility of DLL to transmit a packet to the host using its MAC address when it enters the network. The data link layers 
equivalent of a packet is a frame. Switch and bridge our devices for the data link layer. Network layer. It offers a logical network address. It also handles packet routing which is the choice of the shortest route from a variety of options to transmit the packet. The network layer inserts the IP addresses of the sender and receiver in the header. The network layer segment is referred to as a packet. Networking equipment like routers implements the network layer. Transport layer It transfers services from the network layer to the application layer. It is in charge of ensuring that the entire message is delivered from beginning to end. Additionally, the transport layer offers confirmation of a successful data transmission and retransmits the data if an error is discovered. Transmission Control Protocol TCP for Reliable Delivery and User Datagram Protocol UDP for Unreliable Delivery are two significant examples of protocol used at this layer. The operating system manages the transport layer, which contains data referred to as segments. It interacts with the application layer through system calls and is a component of the OS. Session Layer This layer establishes, manages, and terminates connections between local and remote systems. It controls the logical connection between two systems. TCP in the TCP slash IP stack performs the duties of the session layer. Presentation layer. It is responsible for extracting data from the application layer and formatting it for transmission over the network. Other functions of this layer include compression and encryption and decryption. Application layer. This layer offers end-user application services so that they can communicate with one another across a network. Segments, packets, frames, and bits are the names given to the protocol data units PDUs, that are constructed at each of the OSI model's four lowest layers. Let's now compare TCP and UDP. User Datagram Protocol, UDP and Transmission Control Protocol, TCP are both transport layer protocols, layer 4. While UDP is used for connectionless transport, TCP is used for communications that are reliable and connection-oriented. Although using TCP adds overhead and introduces some efficiencies to the process, it may seem as though you would never want to send information in an unreliable manner using UDP. As a result, UDP is frequently used for applications like voice and video communications, where minimizing packet delay is crucial and justifies for going reliability mechanism. UDP is typically used in applications where reliability is less important than speed. Since there is no initial handshake to establish the connection in UDP, connection setup is quicker. At the transport layer, not all traffic is dependent on TCP or UDP. Non-TCP slash UDP traffic types typically have their own unique protocol identifiers. This session's objectives are to configure and validate IPv4 subnetting and addressing. The fourth version of the Internet Protocol known as IPv4 is a widely used protocol for data transmission over a variety of networks. By providing identification for each device, it creates a logical connection between network devices. For Ethernet communication, IPv4 uses 32-bit addresses in five classes a, B, C, D, and E. Different bit lengths are used for classes A, B, and C when addressing network's hosts. Class E addresses are held back for potential use, while class D addresses are set aside for multicasting. The addresses that starts with 127 are set aside for use with local loopback. Remember that class D addresses are only used for multicasting. A message can be sent via multicast to numerous devices across numerous networks and subnetworks. There are three primary types of IPv4 addressing used by contemporary networking systems for network communication. The first one is called unicast and it is used when sending data from one system to another within a network without intending for it to also reach any other systems. Say you want to send data to print to a printer at 
192.168.1.10 while you are connected to a home network with the IP address 192.168.1.2. No other systems is intended to receive this traffic according to you. The second type of transmission is called a broadcast and occurs when a system needs to send a frame to every user on the network. Two categories can be used to categorize broadcasting transfer, one to all techniques. A. Limited Broadcasting If you need to send a stream of packets to every device connected to your network, this broadcasting feature is helpful. B. Direct Broadcasting this is helpful when a device wants to send a packet stream to every device on the other network. For the distribution of video and audio, television networks primarily use this mode. Address Resolution Protocol ARP, which is used to translate an IP address into a physical address required for underlining communication is a significant protocol of this class in computer networks. Finally, we have Multicast. Multicasting involves sending and receiving data from one or more senders and recipients. This approach allows traffic to flow between unicast one-to-one -one and broadcast channel one-to-all. This approach allows traffic to drift between unicast and broadcast boundaries. Because a single traffic stream serves multiple recipients across multiple networks, multicast conserves bandwidth and server resources. Let's look at why private IPv4 addressing is necessary. The total number of public IP version 4 addresses quickly outgrew the number of available ones, so we need private IP version 4 addresses. After removing the reserved ranges, there are 3706.65 million addresses total available. This easily exceeds the number of devices that require an internet connection, as you can probably guess. Consider your office PCs, home network devices, and mobile phones. To get around this, it is possible to hide behind a single public IP address, a whole private IP address range. The private ID address ranges that are readily available are 10.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 to 10 .255. 255 172.162, 172.31.255.255 and 192.168.192.168.255.255. The private range you select will depend on network design and the total number of addresses need on a particular network. You can set up a rule on your firewall or router that instructs it to present the public IP address 123.123.123.123 to the internet. Whenever you are using a private IP address between say 10.10.10.10 and 10.10.10.100 network addresses translation in this and AT. If we only have one public IP address and hundreds of private addresses, how does it know which IP is mapped to which IP address? Here, port address translation is used PAT. A table is kept by the router slash firewall and very precise port mappings are performed. Thus, it will state that if you come to me on port 12345 10.10.10.10, you should present to the internet on port 45678.123.123.123.123. By using a random port number as the identifier, we can overload many private IP addresses to a single public address in this way. We have talked about IPv4 up to this point. Now let's discuss IPv6 addressing. The IETF created IPv6 to address the issue of IPv4 exhaustion. 
IPv6 has an address space of 2128 and a 128 bit addresses. We use hexadecimal to represent them because IPv6 is so lengthy. Compared to an IPv4 header, an IPv6 header is bigger. Eight sets of four hexadecimal digits make up the IPv6 address format. There is a colon between each group of four digits. For instance, 2001 colon 1111 colon A231 colon 0001 colon 2341 colon 9AB3 colon 1001 colon 19C3. Two guidelines govern how to condense an IPv6 address. A double colon can be used to donate consecutive sections of 0000's double colon. Leading zeros can be removed and the number 0 can be used to represent a group of all zeros 0000. For example, 2001 colon 0000 colon 0011 colon 0001 colon 0000 colon 0000 colon 0001 colon 1ab1 by following the guidelines just mentioned you can condense the address into the easier to read and type version that is 2001 colon 0 colon 11 colon 1 double colon 1 colon 1 ab1 the ipv6 address space is managed by the internet assigned numbers authority iana regional registries receive address space blocks from iana which they then distribute to network service providers Your company then asks a service provider for address space. Network designers frequently use a slash six four mask for all subnets in IPv six subnetting to make things simpler. Keep in mind that this refers to both a sixty four bit host portion and a sixty four bit network portion. The IPv six address type will now be discussed. First, we have the global unicast address. The public address of IPv4 is the same as this address type. In IPv6, global unicast addresses are uniquely addressable and globally recognizable. Next is the unique local address. In that they are not routed on the internet, this address is comparable to an IPv4 private use only address. RFC one nine one eight one 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 zero is always used as the prefix. If the address is local, the one bit is set to one. The significance of al bit to zero has not yet been established. As a result, the unique local IPv four address always begins with the letter FT. In last we have a linked local address the IPv6 address that is automatically configured is referred to as a linked local address the first byte of this address is always FE80 the only communication between IPv6 hosts on a link broadcast segment uses linked local addresses a router never forwards these addresses outside the link because they are not routable let's now proceed to ipv6 addressing modes we start with any cast ipv6 routers can route traffic to the closest any cast device when clients try to connect to an ipv6 any cast address this addressing features configuration in cisco ios is straightforward The IPv6 address configuration must simply be followed by the anycast keyword. Then there is multicast which refers to sending a packet to a number of devices that are eager to receive the information. 
Multicasting completely replaces the broadcasting method used in IPv4 in IPv6. In IPv6, traffic is sent to the IPv6 multicast address FF02 double colon 1 if a device wants to communicate with every other device on the local network segment. The last one is modified EUI-64. According to RFC 2373 Extended Unique Identifier, EUI enables a host to assign itself a distinctive 64-bit IP version 6 interface identifier, EUI-64. The ability to use this feature instead of IPv4 without manual configuration or DHCP is a major advantage. Let's learn how to verify IP parameters for client OS in this session. Every device uses IP addresses that are connected to a network to function. For networking to run smoothly, IP parameters for the client OS must be verified. The verification IP parameters process varies depending on the operating system. A DHCP server is typically present in a network to provide all clients with automatic IP address assignment. The IP address may occasionally not be properly assigned to the clients for any reason. In this situation, a network administrator is required to check the IP settings for the client OS and make any necessary corrections. So what are the requirements for verifying IP parameters in a network for client OS? Verifying whether the client is connected to the network or not is a straightforward requirement. Many times, when a problem arises, the client's IP address can be flushed or cause other problems. The issue needs to be identified right away. First, we must confirm the IP parameters for the client OS in order to diagnose the issue with a specific client. Further action from the networking devices is required if the IP parameters are correctly configured. A client may experience a variety of issues including duplicate IP addresses, IP conflict switches that function similarly to DHCP itself and more. To verify IP parameters for a client OS in a network, we must go through each possibility one at a time. Our job is to verify the IP settings for the client OS and to prevent and fix common network problems. Verifying IP parameters for client OS to check for duplicate IP addresses in one option. It is a very typical issue in a large network. When a new device joins a network, the client may occasionally receive a duplicate IP address. The issue is brought on by networking equipment. Every networking device has the ability to assign DHCP addresses to clients. For instance, if a new switch is added to a network without the DHCP service is disabled, the network will begin to use the default DHCP IP series. When the client is turned on, the new switch may capture a duplicate IP address. Another option is to check the client OS's IP parameters to see if there are any DNS issues. The purpose of the DNS in the network is the first thing we need to understand. DNS offers the capability of comparing a name to an IP address and vice versa. The DNS server IP address is automatically assigned to all the connected clients by the DHCP server. The client screen may display errors like DNS name not existing if the DNS server entry in the IP address is incorrect. In this case, there is also a network path that cannot be found and the IP address cannot be resolved and error echoed. The DNS entry in the DNS server and the IP pool segment in the DHCP server needs to be verified in order to prevent this kind of error. Some networking equipment is set up to use its default DNS server. All networking devices must have these services disabled. Check the TCP slash IP in your client to see if any predefined DNS entries are available. Eliminate the current DNS entry and change it to Obtain Automatically. Make sure this setting is active on all of your network connected clients. 
then we must check the IP parameters of the client OS to make sure no more IP addresses are available. The issue of IP address exhaustion is one that is frequently encountered in networks. In reality, the client's assigned IP address is not a part of the DHCP pool. I'm saying that the network address or range that the IP address assigned to the client is outside of. If a client receives an IP address in the 169.x.x.x.x series while the network is operating on the 192.168.x.x.24 network range, the client will not be able to connect to the network. In the network, this is referred to as the IP address exhaustion condition. This occurs because there are more clients than there are IP addresses available in the DHCP IP pool range. The client's inability to connect DHCP services could be the second factor. A particular switch's connection to the DHCP server may be compromised. First, determine whether your network has any local switches or routers with DHCP servers enabled if you want to prevent IP exhaustion. From there, disable the DHCP service. Extend the IP address in the pool by adding some additional IP addresses if your DHCP address pool is running out of space. Therefore, check the client OS's IP parameters for IP address exhaustion and protect the clients from it. Then we verify IP parameters for client OS for a single client. A single client being unable to assess the network occurs frequently. There could be a lot of reasons for it. We need to check the client's built-in firewall if it is connected to the network for the first time. Its firewall needs to permit network traffic so that it can automatically obtain an IP address from the DHCP service. There could be a problem with the cable that is connected or a poor signal coming from the WAP. There might be an issue with the client's hardware such as the LAN adopter, etc. You must address each problem one at a time. If the client is not brand new to the network and is functioning properly, the problem can be solved quickly. First, make sure the client and the LAN cable or Wi-Fi are connected. Restart the network adapter to get a new IP by using the DHCP service. Check the IP parameters for the client OS to see if the IP address is within the network IP scheme's boundaries or not. Make sure that obtain the IP address automatically is selected in the IP configuration. When a client OS doesn't have internet access, we verify the IP parameters. When the client reports no internet access, the condition frequently occurs. There could be a variety of causes for this issue. This message informs the user that although the client and switch connectivity is good, there is no internet access. Check the IP configuration for your DNS entry. Ping the DNS using your client if you can. In the event that the DNS entry on the DNS server changes, it is very likely that the client will not be able to ping the DNS. Try to modify the DNS entry's default value. Restart the modem or router that is responsible for the network's DHCP service. Network adopters can be turned on and off. The client should be able to communicate with your network's gateway. Make a call to the ISP support if the issue continues when communicating with the gateway. We validate IP parameters for the client OS to assess local devices. A client encounters the sharing issue in the network quite frequently. Printers, scanners, FTP servers and other devices may be shared. Finding the problem with the network sharing devices is very challenging. Rebooting the client first will enable you to find the sharing device when all services start up after the reboot. The local firewall might make it impossible to connect to the shared devices on the specific port. Switch off the client's firewall and try your search again. To see if the shared device is reachable, try to ping it. Reinstall the driver for any network shared printers or scanners. 
The client's access to other services may occasionally be restricted by the antivirus. Verify your antivirus program permits access to the client from sharing devices. Ensure that your client's computer and the sharing device are in the same subnet. The client subnet and the shared devices subnet could very well be different. If the sharing device is not accessible after making the aforementioned efforts, reinstall the driver for shared device in your client and reconfigure the network. We'll now discuss wireless principles as our next topic. First, there are Wi-Fi channels that do not overlap. In wireless communication, two devices typically exchange data. Even more devices can share the medium for data exchange when using a wireless LAN. To transfer data between devices, wireless LANs use radio frequencies RF to transmit a signal. Both transmitters and receivers can be mobile and free to move around or they can be fixed in a specific locations. Our wireless networks send and receive data using a Wi-Fi channel as the transmission and reception medium. There are 11 channels in 2.4 GHz band and 45 channels in the 5 GHz band. Your Wi-Fi performance and coverage can be significantly enhanced by choosing the right Wi-Fi channel. Only channels 1, 6 and 11 in the 2.4 GHz band don't overlap. To properly configure your network, choosing a one or more of these channels is crucial. Then there is SSID. SSID is an abbreviation for Service Set Identifier. A Wi-Fi network is identified by its SSID. An SSID is a 32-character unique ID that is used to identify wireless networks. SSIDs ensure that data is sent to the proper location when several wireless networks coexist in the same area. The network is connected to a MAC address on the AP. A service set identifier is why your client used to connect to this network or workgroup SSID. Therefore, the SSID on an AP is a mashup of the MAC address and network name. This MAC address may be a different MAC address created on the AP or the wireless radio. A basic set identifier is used to describe an AP that only provides service to one network, BSSID. The ability to use multiple SSIDs is provided by APs. This would enable you to use the same AP while providing both as a guest network and a corporate network. A multiple basic service set identifier is used when an AP has multiple networks, MB SSID. Despite serving several networks, it is the same hardware. Users on one network share with users on another because the hardware and frequency range are the same and if they send at the same time, they may collide. Then there is RF. Radio frequencies RF are used in radio transmission to transmit data. The electromagnetic spectrum contains a wide variety of radio frequency bands that are designated for various services. Digital cordless phones, pagers, personal digital assistants, laptops, personal computer memory card international association, PC, MCIA and other devices operate in the 800 MHz to 2.5 GHz range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radio frequency RF signals are used in wireless communication to send RF signals from one device, the transmitter, to another device, the receiver, over open space. As long as both devices are set to the same frequency or channel, and communicate using the same protocol, the transmitter and receiver can always be in communication with one another. An electrical signal is applied at one end and carried to the other end of a wire link to transmit data across it. The signal can spread quite easily because the wire is continuous and conductive. There are no physical cables or other means of signal transmission in a wireless link. The last principle is encryption. Applying a specific algorithm to data to change the appearance of the data, rendering it incomprehensible to those who are not authorized to see the information. 
Datagram Transport Layer Security DTLS keeps packets secure when data encryption is enabled for an AP. Various authentication schemes are used during the identification process. Security features like frame authentication and encryption are used to protect wireless data. The data must be encrypted on a wireless network to ensure data privacy. This is achieved by encrypting the payload of the data in each wireless frame just before transmission and decrypting it upon reception. The goal is to successfully encrypt and decrypt the data by employing an encryption technique that both the transmitter and receiver can use. All clients must associate using the same encryption method because each WLAN in wireless networks may only support one authentication and encryption scheme. For the AP and a client to understand each other's data, they should be the only two devices that share the encryption keys. No device should be aware of the keys or be able to use them to encrypt and decrypt the data. The fundamentals of virtualization will be covered in this session. Virtualization is a crucial area of information technology that has absolutely exploded in recent years with developments and popularity. A software-based or virtual version of something is created through the process of virtualization. Computers, storage, networking, servers and application are just a few examples. A program used to create and manage virtual machines is known as a hypervisor. In order to more effectively utilize all hardware resources, it consolidates virtualized computers and operating systems into one sizable physical server. Additionally, it allows users to run multiple operating systems simultaneously on the same machine. Two different types of hypervisors exist. Type 1. Bare Metal Hypervisor It is put in place right on top of real server. It is the hypervisor that is most frequently used. It has a low latency and is more secure. For instance, open source KVM, Microsoft Hypervisor or VMware ESXi. Type 2 Hosted Hypervisor Between the physical server and hypervisor, there is a layer of the host OS. End user virtualization is its main application. Its latency is greater than that of a Type 1 hypervisor. Oracle and VirtualBox are two examples. Next is virtualization types. Several of the most popular virtualization techniques include Desktop virtualization. In this scenario, desktop operating system like Windows 7 will run in the virtual form alongside other desktop on a physical server. It's also known as Virtual Desktop Infrastructure VDI. Application Virtualization Applications are virtualized and delivered from a server to end user's device such as a laptop, smartphone or tablet in an application virtualization. Therefore, users won't need to log in into their work computers. They can assess the application directly from their device. Hardware Virtualization the most popular type of virtualization in use today is hardware virtualization, which is made possible by a VM known as the hypervisor. Network virtualization. It combines all physical networking equipment into single software-based resource. Additionally, it separates available bandwidth into a number of distinct channels, each of which can be instantly assigned to various servers and gadgets. Storage virtualization. Putting together a single cluster of physical hard drives is what storage virtualization entails. Since the information and data stored on your virtual storage can be replicated and moved to a different location, storage virtualization is used when disaster recovery planning. Implementing this kind of virtualization is incredibly simple and affordable. The use of container is one of the newest trends in server virtualization. This technology became well known thanks to Docker. In a server virtualization environment, containers can operate independently of or alongside virtual machines. The fact that a container is a package containing only the portion of an operating system that might be required as well as the server application or applications 
is what makes it so great. Because a container only contains the application providing the necessary service, it is smaller than a virtual machine VM. Switching concepts is the next topic. Math learning and aging comes first. One of a switch's responsibilities is to become familiar with MAC addresses. Incoming frames are watched by the switch invisibly. The switch's MAC address table contains a record of each resource's MAC address. Additionally, it links the particular port to a resource MAC address. The MAC addresses are unique for each connected device. A switch bases its decision regarding frame forwarding switching on this data. At any time, a host system could be moved or turned off. When MAC addresses are not used for a while, a switch must age them and remove them for the table. By doing this, a vacant address in the MAC address table is released. On a Swissco switch, it is possible to manipulate the aging of MAC addresses. Most Cisco switches have a default time of 300 seconds, Cisco ME2600X from 0 to 1.1 million seconds make up the range. The value 0 can be used to disable MAC address aging. Then there is frame switching. The intelligent port-to-port -port forwarding of frames is another duty of a switch. As we are all aware, the hub receives frames and always forwards them to all other ports. However, the switch filters the same frame that is being forwarded out ports needlessly if its MAC address is fully populated for all ports. In accordance with the destination MAC addresses, it forwards the frame to appropriate path. Frame flooding is the following. Any frame whose destination address is not found in the MAC table is flooded or forwarded to all ports aside from the one on which it was received. It is referred to as a flooding of unknown unicast. When the target MAC address is a broadcast address, it occurs FFFF.FFFF.FFFF. The MAC address table follows. The MAC address table is a crucial part of the switch. It has the MAC address to port mappings which enables the switch to make decisions regarding frame forwarding. We'll now discuss how to interpret the Ethernet frame format. Header is the field that comes before data and pad. The fields following data and pad lead to trailer. There are 7 bytes in the preamble. Device on the network can easily synchronize their receiver clocks thanks to a simple pattern of alternate 1 and 0 bits. One byte makes up the start frame delimiter SFD field. It signifies the start of destination MAC field and the conclusion of the preamble field. The destination MAC address for the frame is kept in the destination MAC field which is 6 bytes long. Additionally, the source MAC address field is 6 bytes long. The proper source MAC address is kept there. The protocol carried by the frame is identified by the 2 byte length hyphen type field. The size of the data and pad field is 46 to 1500 bytes. It's possible that the padding is there to allow the field to be at least 46 bytes long. The actual data being sent from a higher layer of the OSI model is represented by the data portion. The frame check sequence FCS field contains the results of the cyclic redundancy check calculation on the field of the frame except with the preamble SFD and FCS fields and is 4 bytes long. The fields function is to indicate whether the frame encountered transmission errors during its passage through the network. By default, a switch learns MAC address entries dynamically. A switch can also be configured with static MAC address entries.